Hey there, and welcome to the Home Church YouTube channel. My name's Kenny, and I'm the lead pastor right here at Home Church based out of Denver, North Carolina. We're excited that you chose to join us for today's message, and I believe that God is going to use today's word to challenge and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. But listen, wherever you're watching from all across this world, we invite you to join us by subscribing to this channel so that you get the freshest content that we produce every single week. But also, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, we'd invite you to do that as well. Visit our website at myhomechurch.cc backslash give to partner with us. We pray that God uses this message to challenge you today and to bless you as you hear the teaching of God's word. Uh, I just couldn't help, but if this is your first time with us, we're glad you're here. Welcome to Home Church. My name is Kenny. Uh, it's my honor to be the lead pastor here. Uh, I couldn't help but notice that we just finished a series called Dried Up. And I mean, it's like literally going to rain for the next weeks. You're welcome. I'm just saying, I, I felt like, I mean, I thought it was appropriate, right? Um, hey, we're glad you're here. Uh, today is uh, going to be a little different. Normally, we kind of teach in a series, uh, uh, just a, a couple of weeks, three, four, five weeks of a series that kind of focus in on an idea, a concept, or, or a book of the Bible. And we're kind of coming to a transitional phase for our church where uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to be transitioning away from this space that we're meeting in uh, into a new space. And so I didn't really want to start a new series as we head into that. Uh, and so I'm just going to take the next few weeks. Today is uh, the first of those few weeks, and I'm just going to I'm just going to preach. I'm just going to share some things that God's been laying on my heart and conversations I've been having that I think are going to be appropriate and helpful uh, to equip you. And um, I think it's going to be good. So today uh, I'm excited because I've got this uh, this little talk, message, preach, whatever you want to call it, whatever you walk away with it from today, uh, around this idea of purpose, purpose. So you don't have to raise your hand, but in your own head and in your own heart, I, I just want to ask you a question for you to ponder, to, for you to consider. And maybe it's true of you now, or maybe it's been true of you in the past. Um, but I think many of us have wrestled with, like, what am I, what am I here for? What, what is my purpose? Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever had that season of life? And, and again, maybe you're in it now. Maybe you've come out of it recently. Or, or maybe there's still transition in your life. And you're asking yourself the question, like, what is my purpose? What, what, is, what am I built for? Why do I exist here on this earth? Uh, I, I've had this conversation a lot, especially inside of our church, because we've been talking about dried up seasons and dry seasons, and a lot of our folks are walking through uh, a, a, in, into a new season. But uh, as a part of that, the question is, well, what, what does it mean? Like, what, what is the purpose now stepping into a new season? And so I hope today will help you, it'll equip you, and whether that's where you're at right now or, uh, or, or you're coming out of that, or at some point in your life, if you ever question, you can come back to today. You can come back and find this on YouTube or all the other messages <laughs> land forever and ever, unless they kill that off. What if they killed off YouTube? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you can come back and find it and, and help you. And so today, I want to talk to you about the four parts of purpose. All right, the four parts of purpose. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and pull it out. Uh, if you do not have your Bible, that's okay. We'll throw some scripture on the screen. Or if you have the YouVersion app on your phone, it's a great resource. You can follow right along. We have a live event happening right now where you can not only see the scripture, but you can see the points that we're going to talk through today. And uh, as you're finding your way there, I want to talk to you about literally my favorite story in all of the Bible. Uh, my favorite character, my favorite story, and it's the story of Nehemiah. And uh, I've already preached on Nehemiah before, but don't worry, we're, we won't repeat some of that yet. Give me a few years, I'll repeat some of it. <laughs> but today, i got a whole new uh, way of looking at the story of Nehemiah. And he's one of my favorite characters because Nehemiah really is a book of leadership. Uh, and I love leadership. Leadership is one of the things that I do on the side. I have a consulting firm. We teach leadership to other churches and other organizations. I have a heart of a leader. I, I think it's important in our culture to have good, strong, healthy leaders and the book of Nehemiah is just chock full of good leadership stuff. And so, uh, so I want to talk to you today about this story of Nehemiah and how I think it pertains and, and God's word can teach us what having purpose looks like and how to define it. What, how, how do you know what your purpose is? Uh, and, and so we're going to pick up this story and I want you to understand some historical context as to what we're going to walk through. So Nehemiah is just like many other Israelites at this time. Uh, and they have been exiled out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem would have been the home of most Israelites. But the Babylonians took over, invaded, and basically exiled them out of Jerusalem. And very few, uh, very few Israelites stayed uh, in Israel. 
uh, in, in Jerusalem. Many of them were exiled in various parts of, of the world. And Nehemiah is one of those. He went off and he started to serve another king in another kingdom far off. Uh, the king's name is Artaxerxes. Now, you're going to read that, and you're like, how do I pronounce that? It took many years for me to get that one down. <laughs> All right. uh, but he starts to serve this king called Artaxerxes. And where we pick up the story is he has some brothers. Now, I don't know if it's like blood brothers or like, you know, brothers' brothers, right? Um, but he has some brothers come and visit him, and he says, hey, how are things going back home? And, and all of a sudden, this is kind of where our story picks up. And I think we're going to be able to pull out some parts for us to see today to identify how do we find our purpose. Y'all ready for that? Anybody ready to find, need to find your purpose? Good. Well, let's do that. So here's where we start. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 3. And here's what it said. Again, this is the conversation he's having with his brothers. And he says, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province And are in great trouble and disgrace. He's saying some people are coming back now, but there's a problem. They're in great trouble and there's disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. I just need to tell you, anytime something's been burned down on fire, that's a problem. All right. And so if you didn't know, that was supposed to be a joke. Okay. What? Come on. Loosen up a little for me today. Then he says, verse four, when I heard these things, I want you to get this. This is huge. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days, not for some minutes, not for some hours, but for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so I want you to see what's happening here contextually is his brothers come back and they give this report. And he's like, how's it going back home? They're like, yo, it ain't good. The, the, the wall of Jerusalem, and the wall represents so many things to a nation. It represents, uh, it, it represents so many pieces, right? So it represents defense mechanisms. It represents power. It represents structure. It represents uh, differentiating, like, how you, uh, can you be in the city? Can you be outside of the city? It's also a, a, a wall for defense, right? They would stand on top of the wall and be able to see and protect themselves. The wall in this culture represents many, many things. And so for it to be torn down and burning and in disgrace, that's a problem. And, and he's so upset by this. He's so broken over this news. All of a sudden, he just he takes a few days and he weeps over it. And so here's what I want you to see today. If we're going to talk about purpose, to me, it starts to show up in Nehemiah's story. And we'll see how this all plays out. But for you, I want you to understand that the first part of purpose is a burden. The first part of your purpose is born out of a burden. Let me ask you a question. What are the things in this world that you've seen, you've experienced, you've uh, maybe had a taste of, you've, you've witnessed that are so messed up, so broken, so in such disgrace, so ruined, that when you look at it, it literally makes you cry. It brings you to a place of tears. It makes you weep. You're so broken over this. What what is that for you? Have you ever had an encounter with something like that? And so the first part of your purpose has to start with this right here, your your burden. For Nehemiah, he heard that this this country, this city, his people, everything that he knew had fallen apart, and it tore him up inside. And so for for you, there has to be a burden inside of your purpose. What is it that's so wrong with this world that it it literally brings you to tears? And so I'll use a bit, some pieces of my story today just to kind of help you see how some of that plays out. And so for me, I I feel burdened over several things. It's one of the reasons that I planted home church. There are two main ones I'll tell you about. One was that I grew up hating church. Anybody want to be honest enough and raise your hand and say that was true? Yeah, a couple. Thank you for me. Thank you. Copus, thank you, man. I, like, look, I'm just being real. I grew up hating church. I, I didn't enjoy it. I got in trouble. My mama pinched me all the time. Like, the preacher was fussing at me. Like, I got, it, it was not fun for me. Anybody ever seen flannel board Jesus? Like, real. Like, it's a flannel board with Jesus. Like, no thank you. <laughs> Anyways, so I grew up hating church. And so that's a burden for me because now I have three young boys. And if you were here earlier today, they were the ones terrorizing everyone and everything, okay? And I don't want that for them. 
Like, I want them to come and experience church and hear about Jesus on their level and fall in love with it and, and feel a place that they can belong and they feel connected. They have people that they love who, who love them as well. Like, I want my children, and oh, by the way, this is an extension to you. I want your children, and whether they're itty bitties or they're teenagers or they're growing up and they're about to get out the house, like, I want our kids to come and have a place in church that they love that they see like the goodness of God lived out in this house and in this body. And it wouldn't, they wouldn't be turned away by the things that we say or do, but they would feel loved and cared for and, and, and corrected in good ways. But they know it's all out of love, that our children would love church. That's a burden for me. Can you hear it? The, the other part of this is that um, when I was 13 years old, I had an encounter with Jesus, and it changed me. It changed me. And my journey hasn't been perfect, and that's probably most of us. But there's something that happened in that moment that shifted things in my life. My eternity was changed. And I have friends and family, and I've had coworkers, I've had neighbors, and so do you, that they've never actually had that experience. They've never had that moment of change where everything changed for them, where you knew at the very least that their eternity would be changed forever. And so I have a desire to see my friends, my neighbors, my coworkers, people in our community come to that same revelation of who Jesus is that I did when I was 13 years old. And I want for God to change their life the way that he's changed mine. And it's been a process and a, and a maturation, and, and I'm still learning and growing, and I still mess it up all the time. But there's something that's different. And I want for you, for your friends, your neighbors, your family to have that same experience. So here at Home Church, we have this little saying that this town used to be called Dry Pond, and now it's named Denver, and Denver means green grass. And so one of the things that we say often here is that we want to see dry ponds turned to green grass through the watering of the gospel. And very simply, what that means is we have a heart to see anyone here who their spirit might be dried up and dead to hear the gospel of Jesus, and it would change them, and there would be green grass, good, healthy things would grow up out of that. That's what we want to see. That's, that's a burden of mine. And so you put some of those things together, and all of a sudden, I don't know if you can see it, feel like that. Those are some things that break me, some things that I'm broken, that I just have to do something about. That's my burden. So the question is, if the first part of your purpose lies in your burden, what is that for you? What, what are the things that you've seen, experienced, that break your heart, that you've got to do something about? You just have to. So the, the next thing I want to keep, I keep chugging along here. So we're going to move forward in the story a little bit. And so Nehemiah wept, and he, he goes into some time of prayer. He's kind of seeking the Lord on this. And by the way, anytime you're seeking your purpose, you should do the same. You should be seeking out what God says to you and, and, and challenges you in this process as well. And then he, uh, he, he has this encounter with his boss. I want you to see this. Nehemiah chapter 2. We're moving forward just a little in the story. And it says uh, in verse 1, it says, in the month of Nisan, apparently they named uh, months after cars back then. I, <laughs> in the month of Nisan, or Nisan, uh, in the 20th year of the king Artaxerxes. See, y'all see that? It's hard to read. Like, I had to practice hard for that name. King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Watch this. I had not been sad in his presence before. Okay. So real quick, Nehemiah's job in the kingdom, he was a cupbearer, meaning he would bring food and drink to the king and typically test it first to make sure the king wasn't going to die. And so if he tested it and died, guess what? The king probably wasn't going to eat and drink that food. <laughs> and he's in the presence of the king often. Every time he's going to eat and drink, the cupbearer would be in his presence. And so he would be around him a lot. And it said that he had never been sad before the king before. And watch this in verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. Does that sound like a burden to you? I was very much afraid. This is Nehemiah starting to speak. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look so sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, this is important. What is it you want? We're going to come back to this. I want you to underline it, circle it. This is important. What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. 
If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And so I want you to see this. There's so much to break down here. I want to, I want to try to do my best to help, help you see all the pieces of this. And, and, and so the second part of your purpose is the opportunity. So, so the first part is our burden, and the second part is our opportunity. Now, here's what's interesting. Nehemiah has this encounter with the king, and his burden was so evident that, that, to the, that the king had to say, hey, bro, what's wrong? Like, what, what's going on? And, and I just want to encourage you. Like, if you're not real sure what your burdens are, and you're not sure, like, what it is that breaks you, you've been processing that first question, ask someone who's around you, because more often than not, they know you pretty well, and they can tell when you're sad or when you're down, you're brokenhearted, or maybe they've heard you talk about things that have bothered you before. That's a great place to start if you're not sure. But he just read it all over him. He, he, he just, he sees it all over him. And, and usually that's true. Usually when we have such a burden over something, it's easy to see right? Because many of you are like me, and you wear your heart on your sleeve. Like, if if I'm having a bad day, everybody knows it. Like, I can't hide it. I I just can't. I can try all day. I smile, and and like, especially Katie, she'll be like, what are you hiding? I'm like, I'm great. And she's like, no, I know better. So a couple of things here. So we're talking about an opportunity. opportunity. So we have a burden, the thing that breaks our heart, and then we have this opportunity. This is starting to build our purpose, And the opportunity is where God gives you a chance to do something about what breaks your heart. Now, one of the areas that many people miss is that you think that your purpose only falls where you get paid. And I'm just going to, let me go ahead and just kill some of the, like that thought process right now. For many people, operating your purpose is not necessarily where you go to work. It's not necessarily where you get paid to do all of your work. In fact, I, I would say this is that uh, Nehemiah quit his job, right? He, he, he was brokenhearted. God gave him this opportunity. The king said to him, what do you want to do? And I think oftentimes that's what God does to us. God gives us this and asks us this question. All right, you're brokenhearted. What do you want to do about it? And so Nehemiah quit his job, and we're going to see this in a few moments. He quit his job, and he went to be a part of the solution with no promise of a job, nothing waiting on him. He was just so broken over it that there was an opportunity for him to go do something about it, and he did that. So there are some people that are going to fall in two boats. Some of you, you need to understand that following your purpose, you're not going to get paid to do that. But there are some of you that it is going to fall inside of your vocation. It just happened to be true for me, but I want you to understand, there were multiple months before our church planted and before we got going that I worked two jobs and the church wasn't one of them. In fact, there were several months leading up to when we planted home church that I'd put the kids and Katie down at night and I would get up and I would answer a prayer line for the Billy Graham uh, Prayer Association from like 10 p.m. until 3 a.m. in the morning just to make some ends meet. And so I need you to hear this, is that your purpose doesn't necessarily mean that's what you go get paid to do, okay? And if it's worth something to you, it's going to cost you something. Now, I I want you to hear this. Some of the best pastors I know don't work at a church. They don't. Uh, some, Some of the best teachers I know don't have a classroom. Some of the best builders that I've ever encountered have zero tools, So here's what I want you to hear, is that if God's placed a burden in your heart to do something about something that's broken, and he gives you an opportunity to do it, it doesn't necessarily mean you got to go get paid to do that, okay? It it also means this. I want you to see this. How do you clarify uh, your calling? Your opportunity is is really a part of this. So I have this, um, I have this, uh, this formula I want you to see. It's your burden plus your opportunity that equals a calling. Somebody needs to write that down. It's important. Your burden plus your opportunity equals a calling. Now, if you've been watching Manifest like I have, I'm not talking about that kind of calling. Okay? And if you haven't watched it, you should. It's good. Go watch it. But oftentimes in the Christian world, we get all caught up in this word calling. And we make it way, way hard. But I think it can be very, very simple. What are you called to do? What's your burden plus an opportunity to go do that? That's a calling for you. Um, and kind of going back to another point is uh, even if your purpose is in your vocation sometimes you get frustrated because you don't feel fulfilled you don't feel like everything that I do isn't necessarily towards this well I got news for you it's never going to be that way 
Like, I've been pastoring home church for 10 months now, and can I just tell you that I think this is what I was built for. I was built to stand up here and communicate and to teach and, and, and then to pastor people. But can I just tell you all the other things that I do that nobody knows about? And it's not because I'm bragging. I just want you to hear this because this is going to be true for many of you. I edit video. Uh, I deal with our finances, our books. I pay bills. I literally go to hell for y'all sometimes. Katie and I go to Costco to pick up stuff. <laughs> all right. Like, we literally go to hell on earth for y'all sometimes, all right? That's funny. <laughs> and so we have this picture-perfect idea of our, of our purpose, and I just want to kill that off for some of you because many of you are actually in it. You're just missing it because you, you think way too highly of it. You, you're thinking way too perfect of it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. But if your burden is being met with an opportunity to do something about it, that is a great start for your purpose, okay? Um, there's one more thing I want to share with you, and this is going to throw some of y'all way off, okay? Um, but have you ever heard people talk about, well, one door opens and one door shuts? You've heard that, right? Can I just tell you, I don't really believe in that concept. I don't, I don't believe in that idea. In fact, I can tell you many, many, many times in life, I've been standing at the door, and I can almost, I want you to almost have this mental image of like five or six doors, and there have been times in my life when all five of them were open, and all of a sudden I struggle, I'm like, okay, God, well, which one? And I, I want you to hear, God said the same thing to me that he said right here to Nehemiah, he's like, well, what do you want? See, we get so closed-minded that we think there's one door, and that's it, ever and ever, always. And our God is a God of abundance. Our God is a God of opportunity. Our God is a God, he loves you. And he wants to see you operate in the purposes that he's got for you. And oftentimes, there's more than one door, and many of them are open. We just have a great God, and he's like, don't be so worried. What do you want? I've got these all open for you. Why don't you choose the one that you want? This has happened to me before. I've had several great job opportunities in front of me. And I go saying, Lord, all right, Lord, just close one of those doors so I'll know. <laughs> And he didn't. The job offer didn't get rescinded. The both offers were there. And the question remained, well, what do you want to do? I love you, son. I got several doors here open for you. And so don't get so caught up in, well, it can only be this one little tiny, tiny door. And if it's not open perfectly, then no, no, no. What breaks your heart and where has God given you opportunities to do something about it? It's important. Okay, so I want to keep going. Uh, uh, keep on going in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in, uh, here in verse 17. So Nehemiah uh, goes, and he's starting to survey the land, and he comes up with this idea, this vision, this, this plan to see the, the, the wall be rebuilt, which is great because they needed it. And he had this burden, and the king, they, he got this opportunity. And so here he is. Watch this. It says in verse 17, then I said to them, this is Nehemiah, and he's casting some vision. He's saying, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And watch this. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And so part number three to your purpose is the work, is the work. Part one is the burden. Part two is the opportunity. Part three is the work. Once you have an opportunity, then the real work begins. One of the things that I like to think about is, I don't want you to think about sitting in your purpose. I want you to think about sweating in your purpose. See, your, your, your purpose has given you this opportunity, but it's meant for you to actually do the work in it. There's hard work in your opportunity. Your burdens lead you to a place to do something. If you find yourself wondering, well, what's my purpose, and you find yourself just sitting all the time, that might be part of the problem. You might be sitting right in the heart of your purpose, but you're not doing the work that God intended for you to do to see it be fulfilled. Then, watch this. Nehemiah is not just building, but he was rebuilding. And this is a word for some of y'all today, because you feel like you've been building and maybe something's changed, and now it's time to rebuild. This is for somebody today. Is that? In fact, I'm going to write a book about this for leaders one day. I think one of the missing secrets that most leaders miss is that to be a great leader, you have to be ready to start over and over and over and over and over again. See, because great leaders 
are willing and able to bring just as much passion, excitement, and fervor to starting over the hundredth time as they did the first time. And so for some of y'all, you think you missed your purpose. You didn't. It's just time to rebuild again. It's time to get excited and to go back and to remember what broke your heart about it the first time and to be thankful that God put an opportunity in front of you. And it's time to get back to work for some of you. It's time to rebuild. Anything that's worth it will cost you something. Right? Anything that's worth it will cost you something. Gifts are really good. Anybody here like gifts? My son Jackson, you want to make that boy happy, you give him a gift. But here's the problem, and this is true of Jackson, this is true of many of us. We don't value gifts the same way we value the things that we work our butt off for. And so if you just have these gifts, these things given to you, like we might say thank you, but if we lose it, it's like, eh, eh, okay, thanks, whatever. But let me tell you, you're brokenhearted over something, God gives you an opportunity, you go work hard at it, and you earn something, and you hold something, and it gets taken away from you, you're ticked off. You're ready to go to war. You're ready to fight because it means something to you. When you work for something, it's going to matter to you. The work is a huge part of the purpose. The work is a huge part of the purpose. Um, I, I, let's see, I, I want to make sure I get this right. And I mentioned earlier that oftentimes we find that if we're not getting paid, that that's not really in our purpose. But some of my favorite people in our church are people who serve in areas that they are burdened over. We've given them an opportunity and they work hard at it and they don't get paid a dime. Uh, how many of you guys have kids over in Treehouse Kids right now? Raise your hands. Yeah, several of us. Listen. Those folks over there have a burden to see your children know Jesus. Just like, like they, they get it, they understand. And they're not getting paid a dime back there. In fact, just like you, many of them have worked full-time jobs this week. They've dealt with their own kids. They figured out nap time to get over here in time to, to serve. And they're serving your kids. And oh, by the way, they're missing out on the word and the experience today to serve your children. You want to tell me that's not hard work? That's hard work. And guess what? They're not getting paid for it. And so I just want you to understand that sometimes if you're going to operate in your purpose, it does not mean you're going to get paid for that hard work. Uh, this weekend, we're going to serve at a, a thing called Love Denver. It's an organization that's uh, been started by a network of churches, and they um, do a great job of serving uh, kids and families in our community. And they do everything from haircuts to medical well checks to providing school supplies and they do this for children that have means, and most of them don't have means in our community. And there are going to be folks all over our city who are going to serve for multiple hours in the hot heat. I'm sure it's going to be either hot or rainy, so miserable, <laughs> right? And they're going to do that because they have a heart to see people in our city be cared for. Now, why, why would they do that? Because I, I promise you, none of them are getting paid to do it. Why, why would they show up? Why would they do that? It might just be a part of the work that God's called them to. Now, here's what's really cool about this story. Nehemiah rallies all these people, and they rebuild the wall in 52 days. Y'all, anybody else need that kind of construction crew around you? I do. <laughs> I need somebody to build something for me in 52 days. But watch this. They rebuilt the wall in 52 days, but watch this. Uh, this is uh, starting in chapter um, 4. Will you go to the next scripture for me? I just, I can't, yeah. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 4. Sorry, I didn't put it right here in my notes. So Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 4. So watch what happens. So they rebuilt the wall, and all this people are starting to fill back in. It says, now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it on my heart. So you, you want to talk about work. See, Nehemiah had this vision to rebuild the wall, and then he did it. They did it in 52 days. And couldn't you imagine he's standing there like, great. Like, all right, cool. Now I guess I'll go back to King Artaxerxes or whatever. But then he had this revelation because God put it on his heart that the work wasn't yet done. I, I knew you did this one part, but there's more to your purpose. There's more that I'm asking of you. There's more that I'm calling you to. And God put it on his heart that they would still work. See, some of you need to see this today. Although you may feel like you've completed a part of the opportunity God's given you, if you seek him and you ask of him, Lord, what, what is it? And, and I'm just going to talk to some of my seasoned saints here for just a minute. Okay? That's my nice way of saying you old folks. 
See, though some of you have retired, you've raised kids, you feel like in some ways like the work has been done. Can I just tell you that you're not dead, so God's not done with you. There's still purpose for your life. There's still opportunity. There's still things that I know break your heart about what's wrong in our country, in our world. And I'm just here to tell some older folks today that you're not done and God still has a purpose over your life. And at the very minimum, he called you to this house and this house needs you. This house needs you to be a part of raising up another generation. And you might think, well, I'm too old and I can't do it. But guess what? You got some things that other people don't have. You have time, you have wisdom, and you have opportunity that most people don't have. And there are young couples in this church that need you to teach them how to do marriage for many, many years. You got some young adults that need to know how to get a job and actually go out and work and save some money and raise a family. Older saints, I'm just telling you, though you may feel like part of the work has been done, I pray that God lays it on your heart today, if he hasn't already, that there's still more work to be done inside of your purpose. Y'all should be clapping because that's good. (laughs) So that might be where some of you guys are. You might have accomplished a part of the purpose, but there's still more to be accomplished. And if you're doing that, if you take this burden that God puts on your heart, if you take the opportunities that he puts in front of you and you start to do the work and you are faithful, you just work, you sweat, you don't sit, you sweat, you get after it. At some point, part number four to the purpose is the fruit. Part number four is the fruit. When you have this burden... It breaks your heart, leads you to cry maybe. And God opens up opportunities for you to go to do something about it. And you put the work in. Scripture says, work not as unto man, but as unto the Lord. When you put the work in because God told you to, not because Kenny or some other man or some other woman told you to, that at some point there will be fruit for you. There's going to be fruit in this. And this is the fourth part of your purpose. Look at this, Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 1 few pages over. Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 1. Watch this. This is beautiful. So the wall had been rebuilt. Nehemiah still had it on his heart that there was more work to be done in the city. So they built more houses and they started to really fill up the city. And watch what happens. Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. They settled. That means that the work was done. It was time to enjoy it, right? The rest of the people cast lots to bring, watch this, to bring one out of every 10 of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. I want you to see this. The fruit of Nehemiah's work, and oh, by the way, not just Nehemiah, but many other people who had the same burden, the same opportunity, did the same work. He just happened to be the leader. The fruit of this was that the city was in such a great place now, in such health, that there were people living in their own cities, they desired to live in the city, that they had to basically go through a voting, a lottery choice to get into the city to live. Think about this. It's kind of like Denver, right? Everything's growing. So many houses, like everything's popping up. It's almost like you have to win the lottery to get into the city now. It said they chose one of every 10 and gave them the opportunity to come live in the city. Think about that. That's wild. but it's also fruit of the labor. Can I just encourage somebody today that many of you are operating in your purpose, but the thing that you're missing is you're missing the willingness to enjoy the fruit of the labor. You're working hard. God gave you an opportunity. You're brokenhearted, but it doesn't mean that it's still sad. It doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. In fact, I think one of the things that our culture misses out on the most is celebration. I think we don't enjoy the fruit of our labor, the hard work. I just don't think we enjoy it enough. And so if you've been operating in your purpose, God broke your heart and he gave you an opportunity and you've been doing the work. Can I just tell you that when God gives you moments to celebrate, would you just enjoy it? Would you go out to eat with your family? Would you raise a glass and celebrate? Maybe grape juice. Just don't tell me about it, right? Would you, would you enjoy the fruit of your labor? Because here's what happens. When you put all four of those parts together, that's how you know you're operating in your purpose. That's how you know God has given you specifically something to do. 
with this life. See, I don't know if you know this, but not just for Nehemiah, but every single one of you and I, God has in the womb of your mother perfectly and wonderfully and fearfully built you and knit you and gave you ordained from God on high purpose in this life. He's gifted you in ways that nobody else has ever been gifted. He's given you a a mind and and, and a way and a perspective and a skill set that nobody else in this world has. There are many things that other people are better at you in this life, but I promise you there's at least one thing that God's gifted you with that you are better at than probably anybody else you know. And if it's like playing golf or something like that, would you take me next time? Teach me. But here's what I want for you, because this is the same thing I desire for me. I I want for you to operate fully in the God-given purpose and calling over your life. So what is that? And for some of you, you might be like, man, this is it. I'm in it. Like, I see this. I understand. Like, how we, man, I'm in. I'm in. I'm doing it. Great. Like, praise the Lord. We celebrate that. Keep doing it. Don't stop. For others of you, you might have been asking yourself this question, like, what, what, what is my purpose? Why, why am I here? What, what is it that I was created for? And you still don't know. Well, I hope that this will at least start to lead you down that path of finding out what, what it is you were built for. And here's the reason all of this matters. Not because we need to rebuild a wall in Jerusalem. That's awesome. That's great. All, that, all that's good. But because there is a kingdom greater than what you and I know, especially here in the city, there's a kingdom greater than this country of the United States of America, which is a great country. And there's a kingdom that far outweighs all of the kingdoms put together on this world. And it's the kingdom of God the Father, the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reason that you've all been given this opportunity to hear this and whatever purpose God's given you is because he wants to use you for his kingdom. And so whether you're in a classroom, what a beautiful opportunity God's given you to tell others, even if it's just the way you love them, how much he loves them. Uh, If you have a business, the way that you run that business, the way that you make that money, and the way that you utilize that money to fund the work of the kingdom, what an incredible purpose. And I just look around the room. I mean, what you know, folks that cut grass and folks that build houses and folks that sell mortgages and folks that, you know, uh, work in the EMT field and folks that work in a warehouse. Like, I could go down the path. Like, you, there is something inside of you. And whether it's because you do it vocationally or whether it's something you do in the time that you're not trying to make money to provide for your family, your purpose is important because God gave it to you and he expects you to use it. And I pray that you do. I pray that you do. So I want to do this. We're going to turn the lights out. And I just want you to bow your heads. Listen, this is not going to be crazy today or anything like that. We're not. I just want to give you a moment to ponder. And to just ask yourself, sitting in the silence, don't worry about your husband, your wife, your kids. Don't, don't worry about any of that stuff right now. This is, this is a moment for you. Because you can't be what you're supposed to be to those other people unless you understand who God made you to be for yourself. What are the things that break your heart? What's so wrong in this world that when you hear about it, it brings you to tears. You weep. You mourn over it for days. Maybe you've been mourning over it for years. What is that? Where are the opportunities that God has already given you or that you can seek out to do something about the thing that breaks your heart? What are those things? Maybe you don't know. So maybe the question you need, who do I need to talk to? Who knows me? Who can help speak some of this into my life? Who can open up the doors of opportunity around me? And whether you know those things or not, my prayer is that when you do step into the opportunity that you work, 
you put your hand to the plow, that you're faithful with what God gives you an opportunity to do, and that you do it with joy in your heart, with a spirit of purpose, and that when really great days come and you see the fruit of the Lord in it, that you would stop and sing and celebrate and enjoy. I want to take a special moment right now for anyone in the medical field, anyone who's a, a, a teacher, anyone who operates in, in some of those essential places that are, you know, things are ramping up again. Here's what I want to do. I, I want our church to be able to pray for you and over you right now. So you don't have to come up here, but, but if you're in one of those fields or you just know that this season, you just need God to be with you in a special way. Would you just, wherever you are, just stand to your feet. We're not going to do anything weird. We just want to pray over you. But I want, I want to be able to acknowledge that. I want to be able to see you. I want others to be able to see you and to acknowledge that. Great. Don't be shy. That's okay. We're not going to call you out. So here, here's what I just invite you to do. Uh, if you have family that's close to you, with, you know, COVID and all that stuff, like if you want to place your hand on them and pray. If not, if you would just stretch your hand towards someone over these next moments and just... Pray with me as we pray for them during this season. And so, Lord, right now, we come to you in just a special moment of solitude, uh, a special moment of gratitude, God, that we're just thankful for these folks who have chosen to live their life in a place of service, that they would put themselves and their families in place of risk to care for other people in whatever way that looks like, Father, whether it be a classroom, a, an, an ambulance, a, a you know, got a, a, a counseling room. Uh, Father, whatever that looks like for them individually, that you would be with them right now, that you would give them a fresh touch and a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit right now, Father, that you would wrap your arms around them, Lord, in, in right now, that you would let them know that you are with them, you are for them, you will not forsake them. And that, God, we as a body come around them to, to hold them up and to love them and to care for them, to pray over them. And so, Father, right now, we ask for a hedge of protection for safety, for wisdom, for guidance, for stamina. The, Lord, the hard work that they do, that you would give them fruit on fruit on fruit, that they would see it daily, the work that you've purposed them and called them to do, that they would see fruit in it and they would celebrate it in their own lives. And Father, we celebrate that right now. So God, would you be with them? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we love you. We'll continue to pray over you and care for you. Thank you for taking the time to enjoy this message from Home Church. We hope that God used today's message to encourage you and to challenge you as you heard the teaching of his word. Listen, if there's anything in today's message that spoke to you, or if you asked Jesus into your life today, let us know. We would love to celebrate with you. Simply send us an email at hello at myhomechurch.cc and let us know that you made that decision today. Also, if today's message uh, impacted your life, uh, you can take a step forward and a step into supporting the ministry of Home Church by giving online right now at myhomechurch.cc. Again, thank you for watching today's message. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you get all of the fresh content from Home Church.